Do engineers in the real world actually use any of the math they spend thousands of hours learning in university after they graduate? The short answer is yes, but a better question is how much of it do they actually use? If you are currently thinking about majoring in engineering or a current engineering student who loves math, or more commonly, you're having second thoughts about engineering because you're bad at math, then this video is definitely for you. I'll be breaking down every math class you'll take as an engineering undergrad and how much of each you'll actually use in the real world so you know exactly what to focus on. I'll also show you what some of my math exams look like so you know what to expect. Regardless if you're studying mechanical, electrical, software, chemical, industrial, or civil engineering, there are six core math courses that all engineering students have to take. There are Calculus 1, Calculus 2, Calculus 3, Differential Equations, Probability and Statistics, and Linear Algebra. There's also of course more advanced math courses that most universities offer and I'll go over those later on in this video as well. The first course that all engineering majors have to take is Calculus 1. You can also take AP Calculus if you're currently a high school student and skip Calculus 1 in university if you get a 4 or a 5 on an AP exam. This class focuses on limits, derivatives, and integrals. It's important to master these concepts because as an engineer we deal with a lot of complex systems and we can use a derivative to determine the maximum and minimum cost, strength, or amount of material used in a building. We can also use integration to calculate the center of gravity of an airplane or the velocity and trajectory of a rocket. Rocket. Next is Calculus 2, where we learn all about methods of integration and deriving sequences in series. Most engineers will not use any of the knowledge gained from this class in the real world, and it doesn't really have a lot of engineering application. However, there's always exceptions to everything, and if you are an electrical engineer dealing with discrete time or frequency domain signals or systems, it's important to know about or pretend to know about the Fourier series. Mechanical engineers might also use series to predict the life of machine components subject to random sequence of repeated loading. The third class that engineers will have to take is Calculus 3 or Multivariable Calculus. While Calculus 1 and 2 deal with a single variable, Calculus 3 deals with two or more variables, hence the name Multivariable Calculus. In this class, we learn about partial derivatives and double, triple, and even quadruple integration and how to graph and visualize these multidimensional functions. For example, the pressure of gas depends on two input variables, density and temperature. And let's assume in a parallel universe, the relationship can be represented by the function x squared plus 2y squared. We could sketch it and this is what it would look like. We could go a step further and take the partial derivative to determine what temperature and density yields the lowest or highest pressure. Like Calculus 2, most engineers will not use this class on the job. But if you are a finite element analysis or computational fluid dynamics engineer, or you're doing some type of process optimization as an industrial or systems engineer, or working on neural networks as a machine learning engineer, you will very likely apply concepts from this class. Next, we have a class called Differential Equations. These equations are really important because they represent real world phenomena such as fluid motion, the behavior of circuits containing capacitors, inductors, and resistors, material flows in a supply chain network, and even heat distribution in an aircraft engine. Because these equations are very complicated, engineers almost always never solve them by hand and instead rely on different software to solve them numerically. And I'll talk a little bit about these later on in this video. Moving on, we have a class called Linear Algebra. This class is very practical and teaches you how to manipulate and solve linear systems of equations as well as things like vectors, matrices, and eigenvalues. It has a lot of real-world engineering applications and can be used to predict the relationship between drug dosage and patient blood pressure using a linear regression model to compute the ranks of web pages, which is what Google's PageRank algorithm is famous for, or to design a suspension system using software, the most common ones being MATLAB and Python. The last course we have is Probability and Statistics. This is a very useful class where we learn about conditional probability using Bayes' theorem, such as figuring out the odds of a die landing on a 1 given that it's a prime number. You'll also learn probability distributions, confidence intervals, as well as hypothesis testing. No matter which type of engineer you end up becoming, you'll find yourself at some point using probability. For example, let's just say you're a manufacturer or process engineer working on an injection molding line for the newest AirPod case, and the mechanical drawing specifies that the thickness of the case must be between 1.95 and 2.02 millimeters. 
You will need to measure the thickness of an appropriate number of air pot cases to calculate the mean and standard deviation, as well as to determine the ability of the injection molding process to meet specifications, which can be represented by the process capability index, CPK. For example, a CPK of 2 means that it's a Six Sigma or near perfect process and that 99.9999998% of parts are within spec. On the other hand, if the CPK is less than zero or negative, it probably means that you should quit your job because the process is experiencing serious issues. So if I have to rank the practicality and usefulness of these courses when it comes to working the real world as an engineer, calculus 1 linear algebra and probability will be at the top and it's highly likely you'll use the knowledge from these classes more often times than not. Differential equations is not as useful, but it's still crucial to have a high level understanding of them and all of the different methods used to solve these types of equations. Finally, calculus two and three are the least practical and you'll probably use very little to none of the knowledge from these classes. So in total, I would say most engineers on average use 30 to 50% of the math they learn in university in the real world. The biggest difference between engineers and engineering students is that engineers almost always never have to solve math problems by hand because the problems are just way too complex. Instead, they need to have a good understanding of all of the calculus, linear algebra, and probability principles that they learn in school, know which methods to apply in what situations, and rely on software to do all of the computational work. The most common softwares and programming language that 99% of engineers will use to solve math problems are MATLAB, Minitab, Jump, Python, and Excel or Mathematica if your company is poor and behind the game. MATLAB or Matrix Laboratory is a very powerful software that most engineering students will learn that is used for analyzing and visualizing data, developing algorithms, and creating models to solve problems for a wide range of applications, including deep learning and machine learning, signal, video, and image processing, control systems, as well as testing and measurement. There's definitely a learning curve for the software if you've never programmed in your life, but once you master it, the possibilities are endless. Jump and Minitab are both statistical analysis software that are very user-friendly, and many process, manufacturing, and quality engineers use them for applications like Six Sigma, quality control, design of experiments, and regression analysis. Most schools will teach MATLAB, but will not teach Jump or Minitab based on my experience, but if you're interested in giving any of them a try, check out the links down below. There's also a category of advanced numerical simulation software that different types of engineers will use to model and predict real-world phenomena. These software employ different numerical techniques such as the finite element method for solving partial differential equations by dividing an object into smaller, simpler parts. This is why you often have to mesh a part before simulating a problem. The mesh contains elements and nodes that turn irregular shapes into more recognizable volumes for the solver to work with so it can approximate a solution. And this is why it's so important to understand the fundamental principles in calculus and differential equations so that you actually know what's going on behind the scenes and can do a quick sanity check to make sure the software is returning results that actually make sense. For example, if you're a mechanical engineer, you will use finite element analysis or F FEA software such as ANSYS, Abacus, LS Dyna, and Hyperworks, as well as computational fluid dynamics or CFD software such as ANSYS, Flow3D, and Autodesk CFD to model a full vehicle crash or flow over an aircraft wing during takeoff. Civil engineers might use a software called SimSkill to optimize the shape of a skyscraper to quote unquote confuse the winds to reduce oscillation from wind loads. The Burj Khalifa is a great example of this, and this simulation shows how its shape is help keeping the wind at bay. Industrial engineers might use a software called Simulate to simulate an assembly line to increase throughput and cycle times and measure financial, operational, and customer satisfaction indicators. This software uses a method called Discrete Event Simulation to model real-world systems that evolve over time. Now for those of you who love math and find it interesting, let's talk about several advanced math courses that most universities will offer and their engineering applications in the real world. The first class is numerical analysis, which you can think of as a more advanced linear algebra class that teaches you how to directly and iteratively solve linear systems and that many of the numerical simulation software that we mentioned earlier use. For example, Gaussian elimination, gauss seidel and successive over-relaxation are several methods you might learn. In addition to linear systems, this class will also teach you how to model a nonlinear system using nonlinear least squares. This is very useful because many real-world systems are nonlinear 
engineer. For example, say you are a biomedical engineer who is testing a new drug delivery method. You collect some drug concentration data and you know that the concentration of the drug in the bloodstream diminishes exponentially with time, so you can perform an exponential fit to predict future values. The next class we'll talk about is stochastic processes. Now the name sounds scary, but it's actually just any random process or collection of random variables that obey some type of structural relation. You will learn things like power spectral density functions, different filtering techniques like Bayesian, Wiener, That's what she said. and Kalman as well as stochastic models like Markov chains and Monte Carlo simulation. This class will allow electrical engineers to design signal processing techniques as well as model, estimate, and predict random signals and events, mechanical engineers to model vibrations caused by a vehicle traveling on an irregular road, and civil engineers to model fluctuating wind loads on a bridge to make design decisions. The last class we'll talk about is nonlinear systems and controls. This class will teach you nonlinear control techniques including feedback linearization, backstepping, forwarding, and sliding mode control, as well as the concept of stability. This class has many applications including robotics, vibration and noise control, fluid control, manufacturing processes, and biomedical systems. For example, chemical engineers will need this class to design a system to control variables like temperature, pressure, and flow rate in a chemical process to maximize yield. Likewise, this class is essential for automotive engineers designing the adaptive cruise control system of a car and for aerospace engineers designing the autopilot system of a Boeing 777. Now we mentioned earlier that math is an indispensable part of engineering and that engineers in the real world will typically use 30 to 50% of the math that they learn in university, but that could very well vary depending on the type of engineer you are and the nature of the work that you do. We know that the six main disciplines of engineering are mechanical, software, electrical, chemical, industrial, and civil. In terms of math intensity when it comes to these careers, electrical engineers will most likely deal with the most math. Mechanical, chemical, civil, and industrial engineers are next and all use similar amounts of math. Software engineers tend to use the least amount of math and they use Boolean logic the most. However, since each of these six types of engineering are very broad in itself, please take this ranking with a grain of salt. For example, if you're a mechanical engineer doing product design, the most math you will probably use is simple arithmetic and some linear algebra. On the other hand, if you're designing control systems or building CFD or FEA numerical models, it's highly likely that your job will require you to apply calculus and differential equations knowledge in some way, shape, or form. But one thing I can guarantee is that regardless of which type of engineer you decide to become, You'll never have to solve any math problem by hand, unless you want to, of course, because you'll literally have all kinds of tools and softwares at your disposal. So if you still want to become an engineer, but math isn't really your thing, all you need to do is make it through the four years of math in university. Just make sure that your primary job responsibility doesn't involve controls engineering, signals processing, or numerical simulations. Alright, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.